welcome to stay in the altar as long as you need to, but I'm going to go ahead and going to uh, get into the sermon. Let's get some lights on and uh, let's preach the word, right? Uh, the, the service centers around the word. Everybody knows that, right? If you've been around here a long time, you know that God orchestrated and give us gifts of the church, the fivefold ministry. And the fivefold ministry, God downloads into them through our young prophets and prophetesses. Yes, we are prophets and those that are operating in the gifts of prophecy. And then we have those in the office of a prophet that operate in this church. We are a, a five-fold church that is governed by elders. You'll see me post on Facebook that Short Creek embraces the apostolic ministry of teaching, training, equipping, and sending. This is a teaching church. This is a training church. This is a an equipping church as we raise up what the devil had thought he stole. Let me tell you something. The devil is not the things that he stole Gen Z and millennials. But let me tell you what the Lord says. We're sin abounds. Much more than his grace. Yeah. Come on. Yes, amen. They're confused. They're messed up. They're addicted. They don't even know what gender they are. But we're sin abounds. Yeah. Come on. Hello. Let me tell you what precedes every Shoot. great revival. A realization of the sinfulness of a society. Hallelujah. Before every great revival. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love and honor you, praise you. God, we ask it not to be my words, but your words. Father, I yield myself to be used as a vessel to proclaim this word for the Short Creek Church and those watching online or those that may watch later. God, prepare our hearts, break our hearts. Let this seed be rested in fertile ground. God, and then let the Holy Spirit come, God, to break open that seed. And so it can break through the ground and bring forth much fruit in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many people's ever been in a church where they got the same bottle of oil they had since 73, right? <laughs> yeah, that's one thing we go through a lot around here is oil and Kleenex in Jesus' name. Right? Come on, we, we, we don't have regular, we, we had to refill them like this because you never know when somebody might dump it on your head as directed <laughs> by the Holy Spirit. Be sure you're directed by the Holy Spirit when you don't put it on somebody's head. So. Yeah. so we've been talking uh, for months about what is the gospel. And then we got to the blood portion and, and we want to understand what the shed blood of Jesus the Christ does for those who truly believe. So today we're going to talk about the new covenant sealed with the blood of an almighty God that stepped out of heaven, wrapped himself in wicked flesh, and went to the death of the cross. Not as a martyr, but as a savior. Not as one that was afflicted by society, but one who laid his life down for a world that despised and hated him. So a couple of things we already talked, our conscience is cleansed. How many people are living shame free? Come on, don't raise your hand. Amen. Come on. Somebody realizes their position in Christ, right? We have been delivered. Our conscience has been cleansed. So listen, if your conscience is not cleansed, you got to go back and study. You got to go back and read. You got to go back and meditate. You got to cut out those voices of shame and guilt in your life and live in the, the, the redemptive work of the Holy Spirit by way of the cross. I am justified. Legal declaration of the law of God of our innocence. I'm spiritually alive. The scripture says you must be born again. My judgment has been satisfied and I'm at peace with God. It says our wrath was poured out on 
Jesus satisfying our sin debt. We have the power through his blood to overcome the enemy. And last week we talked about, I am no longer under the curse of the law. The old covenant has ended and the new covenant has begun, which is sealed in the blood of Jesus. The law represents the old covenant, but now we live under a new perfect covenant sealed with the blood of Christ. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, declares Luke 22 and 20. Everybody needs to understand the difference between a covenant and a contract. I've been in finance for a long time, been out of finance since about 2018. And there's all kind of contracts you have to sign when you begin to enter into an agreement with a company. Those contracts are based based on mistrust, a covenant is based on trust. When you sign that contract, it is all about protecting the company and has little to do with protecting you. But when we read the covenant of God sealed with the blood, we know that that covenant is all about the benefits, all about the redemption, all about the holiness, all about the freedom, all about the authority, all about overcoming the comes by way of an agreement that God made with you signed not with human hands but signed in your heart with the blood of an almighty God. So a contract is based on mutual exchange while a covenant is based on unconditional commitment. Have you unconditionally committed your life to Christ? We often see people come. I call them jailhouse conversions. I know one of my Latin King buddies that live in South Texas. He told me a long time ago, he said, Preacher, you're the only one that I was in prison with that actually got out and done what he said he was going to do. I said, well, I, God redeemed me. God restored me. I know that there is benefits and blessings uh, for being obedient and there's uh, turmoil and strife. Uh, I've lived a life of the devourer. I've lived a life of turmoil and strife. I lived a life uh, being owned by the one uh, that wanted to kill, steal, and destroy me. I'm coming out of agreement with it. Uh, I'm going to live now by the new covenant, uh, the agreement that I made with God. It is the great exchange his life for mine. Some of you are trying to hold on to your life and live in the benefits that was sealed with the cross. It doesn't work that way. If you want to enjoy this life, the abundant life that God promised for you here on the other side of eternity, you got to understand that it was a great exchange. He gave his life for my life. It's no longer my life. It's no longer my wife. It's no longer my children. It's no longer my cars. It's not even any longer my dogs. It's not my money. It is his. He bought it. He purchased it. He paid the price for my redemption. How could I not give it all back to him? Why am I trying to hold on to the unforgiveness and the bitterness and the anger and the addiction? I don't want it anymore. I want to walk in the fullness that God has given me. Come on. It's a valid. A contract is invalid if one party breaches it, but a covenant remains valid even if one party Breaches it. I know I was speaking to a young man the other day. He found himself in a county jail for quite some time. He got out. And the Lord asked me to ask him, said, hey, bro, did you make a deal with God while you were in that county jail to serve him and to live for him? He said, yeah, absolutely. I said, you need to honor the vow that you made to the Lord. He was supposed to come to church and he sent me a message. He said, Pastor Ron, I just want to have a little fun. Well, later on, a few days later, he sent me another message talking about how he was contemplating taking his own life. There was no hope for him. Let me tell you there's a great exchange. You want to walk in the abundance in the freedom in the peace of God. Give him everything including that ungodly relationship that you are in. 
Hallelujah. Mm. A, co a covenant is about a relationship and a contract is a transaction. It is sealed and covenant is usually sealed or guaranteed. Ours is sealed with the blood of Christ when a contract is simply signed. Thank you, Jesus. It is that there's a purpose. A contract is mutually beneficial. While a covenant is promised to benefit the relationship. It's personal. A covenant is personal and relational. While a contract is about interest. In the Bible, a covenant is a relationship between two parties who make a binding promise to each other. The new covenant is the promise that God will forgive sin and restore fellowship with those who hearts are torn toward him. I'm not telling you got to get it all figured out. But everything that God says, surrender, surrender. When it says, be not conformed of this by this, be not conformed by the patterns and the thinking of this world, but be you transformed the miracle, the grace of God to change your mind. Because without the Holy Spirit, there is no changing. Without the fire, without the oil, without the fresh wind of the Holy Ghost, there is no, there there is no hope for change in your mind. Oh, Amen. Oh, Come on. But as the Lord brings those things, we surrender them. And our hearts are turned more and more and more toward him. Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new covenant and, on, and his death on the cross is the basis of the promise. The old covenant God established with his people required strict obedience to the Mosaic law because the wages of sin are death. The law required Israel to perform daily sacrifices to atone for sin. But Moses, through whom God established the old covenant, also anticipated the new covenant. Look at Deuteronomy 29. Hebrews is the best book to understand how the old covenant points to the new covenant, especially chapter 9. So turn with me to Hebrews 9. And we're going to go through verses 8 through 15. I'm going to be reading out of the NLT. Probably the easiest for me to uh, comprehend. And I think it's important that we comprehend this. Uh, it's, it's not, I don't think, it is vital if you're going to walk in the freedom of Christ to understand how the old covenant has been made new. Thank you. Hebrews 9, 8 through 15. And I'm reading out of the NLT. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This was an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and the sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. Did you get that? So under the old law, listen, trying to live for God by applying a bunch of rules, by living by a bunch of rules, will never cleanse your conscience. The way that we cleanse our conscience is by truly knowing Him. It is intimacy with Jesus as we grow in our understanding and knowledge of who Jesus is. We'll understand that we have an Abba Father, that we are sons and daughters of God, and that God in heaven is nothing like our earthly daddy, that he loves you, he doesn't condemn you, he's just waiting on you to step toward him and step away from the deception of wickedness in this world. Well, that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect until a better system could be established. The entire Bible points to the redemption of those who believe in Christ Jesus. It points us to the gospel message. We can find Jesus from Genesis all the way to Revelation. 
The old covenant with its many ceremonies and ordinances could not make us right with God. It lacked the grace, the unmerited, unearned, imputed Holy Spirit power of God to cleanse us so that we could boldly approach the throne and enter in to the most holy place. And so in the Old Testament, if a priest went in unclean, they literally tied a rope and some bells to his legs. So in the outer court, that represents what? That represents our flesh. In the inner court, in the temple, you got three parts of the temple. That is the, the holy place. That is where the sacrifices was made. And in the most holy place, the high priest went in with the blood. But if the high priest wasn't right, he would fall dead and they couldn't go in and get him. They had to drag him out of the holy place. But no more because you have been washed. You have been cleansed. You have been redeemed. You have been restored. The righteousness of God has been imputed into those that believe now we can enter in the most holy place with all boldness. So Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made with human hands and is not a part of this created world. Jesus, as our high priest, ministers in the superior sanctuary, the very throne room of God. This is an obviously a place greater than anything human hands could make. <coughs> Verse 12. With his own blood, not the blood of bulls and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. Some of you are trying to make sacrifices for sins that God has forgiven. God is, you're saying, God, I'm still struggling with this. God is saying, struggling with what? I have forgiven as far as the east is from the west. Somebody needs to understand that that guilt was conviction. You repent, you move on. But when we begin to live in condemnation, we'll walk in shame. I want to see somebody in these altars with their heads held high. Yeah, I believe in the humility of our heads down, but I need to see somebody move from down to up as they raise their hands to our almighty God and weep and cry because you have been washed, you have been cleansed, you have been perfected, and you are the righteousness of God, completely clean, able to enter the most holy place. Glory. Praise the Lord. The veil has been rent. There is no veil. It's gone. The Holy Spirit has been released. The high priest entered once a year going through the veil and back again, letting the veil fall behind him as he left. The barrier remained. Jesus tore the veil and continues to stay in the most holy place, heaven itself, welcoming us in. This is what makes Christianity all about access, not barriers. Ephesians 2, 6 confirms uh, that we are seated uh, in heavenly places with Christ. It was his own blood. Blood in scripture always uh, includes two thoughts. Uh, death suffered uh, and life offered. Charles Spurgeon said it like like this the Lord Jesus Christ did not come to earth to make a reconciliation by holiness of his life or by the earnestness of his teaching but by his death Charles Spurgeon also said this the Lord Jesus did not bring before God the sufferings of others or the merits of others but he brought before God the suffering the death of his own life as he become the permanent, lasting atonement for all your sins. Amen. 
under the old system, the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers could cleanse people, people's bodies for the ceremonial impurities. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from the sinful deeds so that we can worship a living God. This morning in Sunday school, we talk about strongholds. You know how you tear down a stronghold with the blood of Jesus. You know how people are healed with the blood of Jesus. You know how people are set free from demons with the blood of Jesus. Somebody needs to understand the horrific nature of the cross, the price paid, that you can be saved, that you can be delivered, and that you can be healed. It is finished. The veil is rent. The Holy Spirit has been released, and he's taken up rest residence in you and he's wanting to commune he's wanting to talk but you've got to divide the soul and the spirit with the sword that's sharper than any two edged sword you got to divide that spirit and be spirit led and not soul and emotion led in Jesus name but by the power of the eternal spirit Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for sins our conscience is a wonderful tooth from God, but it's not perfect. Our conscience can be clean, seared, it can be defiled, and it can be evil. The believer is cleansed, conscious and all, not to live unto himself to serve, but to serve, not to live for himself, but to serve the living God. The ancient Greek word translated serve which speaks to a religious and ceremonial priestly service. Charles Spurgeon also said this, and dear friends, to keep in mind that you are henceforth to serve the living God. You, you are acquainted with the Greek, will find the kind of service here mentioned is not that which a slave or a servant renders to his master but a worshipful service such as priests rendered unto God. We have been purged by Christ and we are rendered to God the worship of a royal priesthood. It is ours to present prayerfully thanksgiving and sacrifice. It is ours to offer the incense of intercession. It is ours to light the lamp of testimony and furnish and the table of showbread. Because it tells us in uh, uh, Peter that we are what? We are a royal priesthood, uh, divinely separated uh, to minister unto God. Verse 15. That is why he is the one who mediates. How many people know you got an attorney? You got an advocate. When the devil brings accusations, the devil says, No, he's repented, he's confessed. That is under the blood. Yeah. And if you want to believe the devil, you can. Or you can look at the devil and say, no, devil, not today. I don't believe that. I don't come into agreement with that. Yes, I was addicted to pornography. Yes, I was an alcoholic. Yes, I was an addict. But I have been redeemed by the Amen. blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Come on. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins they had committed under the first covenant. Remember, he said, it is finished. The new covenant involves a total change of heart so God's people are naturally pleasing to him. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law of Moses and to establish a new covenant between God and his people. Do you know, truly know, all the benefits of the covenant that the Lord God Almighty has made with those who have surrendered their wills to him? Have you not, have we not stayed in a John 8, 31, 32, multiple times do you know the truth of the new covenant Satan's plan for you is to keep you from fully knowing the truth the benefits the guarantee the covenant that God sealed for you the seed that was sown in us by God 
that our conversion, our spiritual birth is only the beginning. Being a child of God and being free in Christ is a positional truth and is every believer's covenant birthright. Because of the lack of repentance and ignorance of the truth, many believers are not living like liberated children of God. They still see themselves as just old sinners saved by grace, not as the saints that scriptures declares them to be. Slavery in the United States was abolished by the 13th Amendment, December the 18th, 1965. How many slaves were there on December the 19th? In reality, there was none, but many still lived like slaves. Many did not because they never learned the truth. Others knew and even believed uh, that they were free, but chose uh, to live as they had been taught. Several plantation owners were devastated by the proclamation of emancipation. They proclaimed, we are ruined. Slavery has been abolished. We have lost the battle to keep our slaves. But the chief spokesman slyly said, not necessarily. As long as they think they're slaves, the proclamation of emancipation will have no practical effect. We no longer have a legal right over them, but many of them don't know it. Keep your slaves from learning the truth and control them getting uh, and your control over them will not even be challenged. But what if the news spreads? The spokesman Satan replied, don't panic. We have another barrel in our gun. We may be unable to keep them from hearing the news, but we can still keep them from understanding it. They don't call him the father of lies for nothing. We still have the potential to deceive the whole world. Just tell them that they misunderstood the 13th Amendment. Tell them that they will be free, not that they're already free. Someday they may receive the benefits, but not now. But they will expect me to say that, won't they? They won't believe me. Then pick a few persuasive uh, heresy hunters, uh, ones who are convinced that they are still slaves, just old sinners uh, saved by grace, uh, and let them do the talking for you. Remember, most of these free people were born as slaves. Uh, and has lived as slaves. All we have to do is deceive them so that they still think that they're slaves. I am not a slave to sin. Redemption says, I am free. Who are you going to believe? Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. They will maintain their slave identity because the things that they do. The minute they try to profess that they are no longer slaves, just whisper in their ear, how can you even think you are no longer a slave when you're still doing the things that slaves do? After all, listen, let me tell you something. You're struggling with a sin. Hallelujah. Your pastor struggles too. But my identity is not in the struggle. My identity is in who God says that I am. I am a son of Abba Father who wants good for me. Amen. Amen. Come on. The minute they profess that they're no longer slaves, just whisper in their ear, how can you even think that you're no longer slaves when you are doing the things the slaves do. After all, we have the capacity to accuse the brethren day and night. Years later, many still have not heard the wonderful news that they have been freed so naturally they continue to live in the way that they've always lived. Some have heard the good news, but evaluated it by what they're presently doing and feeling. What did what did we learn this morning? The truth and the facts are not the same. The facts never impact the truth. It is the truth that impacts the facts. You may be struggling today. Speak the truth over the struggle. Know who you are and learn how to walk in the freedom Guaranteed to you by the blood that was shed. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. 
I'm still living in bondage, doing the same things I've always done. My experience tells me that I must not be free. I feel the same way before the proclamation, so it must not be true. After all, your feelings always tell you the truth, right? No. <laughs> No, 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 man. My feelings never tell me the truth. Hardly ever tell me the truth. What, do, what is the truth? The truth starts in Genesis and goes to Revelation. Hallelujah. It is the inspired word of Come God. On. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, yes. for correction. It oh. is perfect. Uh, God has a word for you today. Walk in the freedom uh, that he has given you. Proclaim the truth over your facts. Uh, begin to speak. I am not an alcoholic. Uh, I am not an addict. Uh, calling those things as not as though they were. I am redeemed. Uh, I am restored. I am justified. I have been legally declared right by the God that spoke the world into existence. Oh, Amen. Amen. Our former slave, one former slave hears the good news and receives it with great joy. He checks out the validity and the proclamation and finds out that the highest of all authorities has originated the decree. Not only that, but he personally cost the authority a tremendous price, which he willfully played, willingly played, so that he could be free. His life is transformed. He correctly reasoned that it would be hypocritical for him to believe his feelings and not the truth. Determined to live by what he knows is true. His experience began to change rather dramatically. He realized his old master has no authority over him and does not need to be obeyed. He gladly serves the one who set him free. Many Christians today never learn the truth about their freedom. And some of those that know the truth, slavery was the only life that they know. So many Christians remain in bondage because they will not take the time to learn about their freedom. Have you dedicated your life to knowing the truth of the new covenant sealed with the blood of Christ? In closing, as the worship team comes up, I just want to read John 8, 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believe, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Some people try to separate Christians, regular Christians and disciples. There is no separation. If you're not a disciple, if you're not abiding in the word, you are not being disciplined by the by the Lord. Amen. We need discipline. How many people, how many people were raised like hell, went to a rehab somewhere and got some discipline that radically changed their life? Amen. Amen. The word abide means to remain, continue, to tarry, to endure, to be held, kept, to remain as one, not to becoming another or indifferent. And you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How asinine was it for them to say that they lived in bondage for 430 years? How can you say we'll be made free? Jesus answered them, Most surely I tell you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I'm a son that is abiding with the Lord for eternity. Amen. We see a progression. When we submit to the Lordship of Christ, we then become Christ's slaves. But we don't stay as slaves because we're not orphaned. As we submit to his lordship, we begin to understand through intimacy with him, we are sons and daughters. Romans 8, 17 in closing says, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, God, in fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Freedom isn't the ability to simply choose. It isn't free will. For a believer, it is the ability, the imputed grace of God to make the right choice. We want to open these altars up. If you listen to these notes, there's a lot more of them. We'll be on, on the website tomorrow. But we want to open these altars up for anyone that needs to pray. Listen, I believe in a God that saves, delivers, and heals. 
I don't think God's through this morning. I, 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 if you're struggling with anything, listen, I, I want you to calm. If you're not sure about your relationship with the Lord, I want you to calm. If you need to make a new commitment, rededicate your life, I want you to calm. I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to be shamed. I don't want you to die, uh, buy into the lie of the enemy. There's no judgment in this place. If you haven't read the unaddicted, you need to. You'll know that there's no judgment in this place. I put all my sins out there so everyone will know that if God can redeem me, if God can restore me, he can redeem and restore you. There are, there's no one too far gone for God. Let's worship Amen. Amen.